you lose a thing, you don't know where you've lost it. But if you leave your first love, you knew what separated you in that intimacy with him. As you said, Mr. Ragnall, just down the street, there's a very high-class store. I love to swim, and I saw a, a beautiful swimsuit. Well, that's the way it goes, isn't it? I looked, and I coveted, and I took. She saw it a second time. The third time she went in the store, it was folded up on the edge of the counter. And she slid it under her coat, and told her mother that she found it. And she said, tonight, in the middle of the service, your voice died away, and a voice said a thousand times or more, the voice kept saying, swimsuit, 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 swimsuit. But I didn't know anything about the swimsuit. The spirit did. I said, well, there's one way to get your joy back. That's go back to the place and, and pay for it. She said, well, I, I don't have money. I said, well, I'll give you a little money toward it. What did it cost? That was in days when money was money. She said, I think she said $15. Ooh, wow, that's a lot of money. I'll give you a couple of dollars towards it. Uh, is your mother here? Shh, don't let my mother know. She's the proudest woman in this church. Is your mother here? Mm-hmm. Where? Oh, she's at the back of the church. She has that big straw hat on. That cartwheel hat. You better get that. No, 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 no. I said, good night. I walked away. Don't leave me, she said. Don't leave me. I said, I will if you're not prepared to put things straight with God. All right, let my mother come. And the mother came out and said, hello. Oh, my daughter's here. I don't know what she's doing here. She's the finest girl. In. She, she leads a youth meeting and she sings in the choir and she gathers more permissions than anybody else. And why is she here? I said, because she's a thief. A what? <laughs> my daughter, a thief. I said, well, she says so. If you want to argue with her, argue with her. Are you a thief? She said, Mother, you know the swimsuit I told you that I found? I didn't find it. I stole it. And for 15 months I'd been troubled about it. But I'm going to confess it to God and I'm going to pay for it somehow. My mother stiffened and looked as much as to say, you little wretch. And I said, Mother, listen, bend your knees and get down at the side of her and put your arm round her and say, God will forgive you and I will forgive you. My mother looked at me contemptuously for a moment, then she got down like this. <laughs> I was sure she was going to break in two before she got there. <laughs> that girl just struck oil like that the burden went and she jumped up like the man in Acts 3 and she ran down the church leaping and praising God and says pastor I just got my joy back oh praise the Lord I feel great and he says you well, I, I, don't, I, don't under, I don't understand you're the best girl in the church you're singing the choir you're doing... she said for 15 months I've been a backslider in my heart I knew I did a wrong and the joy bells haven't rung and fellowship's never been the same and the word of God has been dry and prayer has been unreal well, I thought, this is great. And I was putting my coat on, got my arm through one sleeve, and somebody said, would you help the lady at the altar? <laughs> oh, the dear lady with the cartwheel hat. I went up and said, what's your problem? <laughs> you notice my daughter said that she cheated on me for 15 months. Yeah, that's what she said. Mr. Raynor, I've got a mother at home who's over 80 years of age. I've cheated on her for 15 years about a sewing machine. And in the middle of the meeting tonight, while you were preaching about something, I didn't hear you for the last, uh, well, whatever time it was, I didn't hear you for the last 20 minutes. All I heard was a voice saying, sewing machine, sewing machine, sewing machine, sewing machine, sewing machine. Now, I did not mention sewing machines. I did not mention swimsuits. Who did? The Holy Spirit did. I said, wait a minute. What you sow, you reap. You cheated on your old mother for 15 years. Your daughter has cheated on you. What happened to David? He took another man's wife. He committed adultery. And then he committed murder to cover the adultery. What happened? He went to his mansion one day. There was a body. Turn the body over. It's my son. Who killed him? His other, brother, his other son said, I killed my brother because he took my sister and violated her. Watch it. Be careful what you sow, you reap. He committed adultery, he found it on his own doorstep. His son raped his sister. And then the other brother murdered the son who committed the, the, the awful act. The 
saddest case I had in this area was in the town where I met my darling wife, a place called Eccles. We had a Saturday night service, and I preached actually on this psalm, now I think of it. A woman came up to the front. She was the most miserable, ugly... I've seen some ugly women. <laughs> Apart from present company, of course, but... Oh, was she ugly. She'd a nose like a banana. She, she was as wrinkled as a prune. She wore black from head to toe. <clears throat> I said, what's your problem? She says, I, my name is Mrs. Shepherd." Forty years ago, I was an officer in the Salvation Army. I, I, I worked uh, with, with, with another officer, another lady, and we didn't get on too well. And one night I got angry. You want your own way in every meeting, she said. I came home, I took my Salvation Army bonnet, and I ripped it up and put it on the fire. I took my Bible, I tore every page out and burned it. I cut up my uniform and burned that. And for forty years, she said, Oh, I listened to William Booth preach. I listened to Colonel Brangle preach. I listened to Commissioner Railton preach. I heard the great giants of the Salvation Army, and not once did my spirit to respond. I was as dead as a stone. But tonight she said God spoke. God spoke. And right now I want to repent of my sin and I want to ask him to restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And she said through her tears, I know he'll do it, but what about the 40 years I've wasted? He won't give me those back. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And then finally he prays the greatest prayer of all in this 10th verse, Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Charles Wesley puts it this way, Purge me from every sinful blot. My idols all be cast aside. Cleanse me from every sinful thought. From all the filth of self and pride. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. A heart that always feels the blood so freely shed for me. A heart in every thought renewed and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good. A copy, Lord, of thine. In the Bible school I went to, it was a Methodist school. They used to sing a hymn written by an old Methodist, Folks Jackson. And the hymn said this, I want, dear Lord, a heart that's true and clean. A sunlit heart with not a cloud between. A heart like thine, a heart divine. A heart as white as snow on me, dear Lord. A heart like this, Mr. Notice what, I wonder what David knew about science. He says, wash me and I shall be wiser than snow. When you get up in the mountains, we were, last week we were in California, and there was a snowfall overnight, and as we came back, the snow was glistening, it was blinding with its whiteness. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Yes, why? Because in every flake of snow, you know the old saying, there have never been two snowflakes alike. Build a heart to praise my God. After all, what's the problem with the world that you and I live in? What's the problem? It's got heart trouble. The heart of the matter is the heart of man. Isn't it amazing that one man can give his life to God and become a saint like an F.B. Meyer or some of these giants of faith? Another man made of the same corruptible material becomes a Himmler or a Stalin or a Hitler or a, a Mafia member? The most mysterious thing in the world is again human personality. The dreadful possibilities if I get out of line with the will of God. I can become as corrupt as any man that ever lived. Again, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by his own mercy he saved us. And we quote over and over again the word, don't we, is it, uh, Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful <coughs> above all things, and desperately wicked who can know it. No man can know it. There's no plumb line you can put into it. 
the men use their brains, and rightly they should, but what about the heart, the seat of our affections? Oh, if only you could diagnose a section of the heart and, and give surgery to people who have one corner that's full of the gangrene of malice, and another corner that's full of yellow envy, and another area that's full of bitterness, and all part of that heart which is lustful and, and, and it aspires after every unclean thing or even every legitimate thing. It lusts, it lusts after fame and wealth and so forth. The heart is the most mysterious thing. You can fathom the brain to some degree at least. You can, you can take it apart and show me sections of it. You can't do that with a human heart. In the, in the book of wisdom where it says keep thy heart with all diligence in Proverbs 4:23, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it come the issues of life God says to Israel I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh in his most awesome message Jesus says blessed are the pure in heart not they shall be blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God I try to think every day of people crowding temples and shrines in countries I've been in and countries I haven't been in. People take costly offerings. Back in the days when Amy Wilson Carmichael was in the Donovore Fellowship, somebody saw a woman going down a road in India. She had a beautiful, gorgeous, healthy child. And I've seen some lovely children in Israel, uh, pardon me, in, 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 in India. Swarthy skin, dark eyes, flashing eyes, lovely teeth. She was taking a little fellow about three years of age and she had a, a crippled, deformed child in her hand. The missionary stopped and gave her a little talk to the lady and gave her a tract. The missionary went and emptied a sack of literature and came home down the dusty road at night, tired and worn out. Saw the same woman coming up the road. They were passing the other way now. She'd only one baby. She stopped to ask her, had she sold the child? She said, no, no, no. I made an offering to my God. I, I was in debt to my God. I, 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 I had to go and appease my God. And she threw one of her children into the river Ganges. But it wasn't the crippled one. Her God deserved the best. It tore a heart. It took something that could not be replaced. But a God deserved it. And this morning all over the world there are people crowding shrines. They go to gods made of stone. They cry to gods that can't hear. They look at stone hands that can't help them. And yet their devotion shatters all our devotion. I read in one of the Operation Mobilization reports this week about a man going down a road somewhere at four o'clock in the morning meeting a man who was already going to make an offering. And he said, well, of course, I was up at four o'clock and I waited on God until six o'clock and now I'm going to the temple. He'd already had two hours with his God. He's a Mohammedan. Our Christianity doesn't cost as much now, does it? We live on the easy street, we'll all get a nice meal before too long. We get in our nice cars, go to our nice homes, and the world goes to hell. There's something wrong with our hearts. Is it a stony heart? Or is it just a cold heart? And is it awesome that in Acts, what is it, chapter 3, where, uh, where, where uh, Peter speaks to Ananias, and he says, Why has Satan filled thy heart? We try to try to get some logistics or statistics here. How many millions of people in America today, never mind the heathen countries, how many in this great country we love so much, how many people have hearts filled with Satan rather than filled with God? What did say Jesus say? Out of the heart proceedeth what? And all the horrible rotten things that corrupt life and corrupt even church life. David says, create in me a clean heart. Nobody else can do it but God. 
Yeah, the simple illustration I'm through. My, how it's poured with rain. Somebody yesterday said, my, it's coming down. I said, don't worry, it's when it's coming up you're in trouble. <laughs> it was coming down for now, but it started coming up, and when the waters above met the waters beneath, wow, you're in trouble. And after those 40 days in the ark, you remember, it was a wonderful ark. It only had one window. And it wasn't at the side, it was in the roof, so he could look heavenward and see the light of God. The ark is a type of the church, if you like, or the world, if you want. There's only one light for it, that's Jesus Christ. The ark only had one door. And there's only one door by which any man can enter in and be saved. I don't know how he got on with all those beasts in the ark. It must have been really something. It must have been the type of the millennium. The lion must have laid down with the lamb, otherwise he'd have had it for lunch. It must have been wonderful. And when the rain stopped coming, he opened the window and he let out a bird, a raven. I wish it hadn't have been a raven, but it was. A raven is a carnivorous bird. It eats flesh. It won't eat your crops. You see them on the side of the road. Those big crows are a type of the raven family. And you see them when somebody's run over a dog or something, tearing the flesh off, eating the flesh. When that bird got out of the ark, he thought, boy, is this great. He got a personal millennium. Flesh, flesh, flesh. Everything you can imagine. Could eat a bit of a man in the morning and eat part of an animal at night and eat something else. Bodies floating everywhere. What more could you get? And then he opened the window and he put out a dove. The dove is not a carnivorous bird. It will, it will die rather than eat flesh. And it went round and round and round and it found nowhere to rest its foot. Oh, not only will it not eat flesh, when it comes near anything dead, it, it's offended by death, it will not put its feet, never mind eat it, it won't, be, it won't contact death. Not only again not will it not eat it, it will not touch it. And it returned to the ark and he took it in. And it stayed there until he let the uh, bird out again and the flood had subsided. And it stayed out and then it came back with that leaf in its mouth. The psalmist says the holy anointing oil of God is like the oil they put on Aaron's head. And then it ran down his face. No, it didn't. It ran down his beard. And it ran down his garments. And it fell off his garments onto the floor. That holy oil will never sanctify the flesh. It will never sanctify corruption. I think of a friend in Manchester, England, and he, he kept doves. He kept them on the housetops. Built some little houses between the chimney stacks. He had some of the best birds in town. One day a friend came along and he said, I want to show you a new bird of mine. Watch this. And he took a handful of the grain and he whistled. <laughs> and the bird came and just as it perched on his wrist to take that, that grain, he closed his hand like that. And the bird flew back on the roof. He did it a second time. The man said, now don't tease it. That's not right to do it. Oh, he said, this bird doesn't care. He said, I, I've got the bird trained. He's my special prize. I love to exhibit my, my skill with him. And the third time he whistled. And as the bird was going to grab the food, he, he tightened his hand. And the bird flew around the, around the roof again. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. It flew over the roof. He's never seen it from that day to this. Meetings are very wonderful. Possibly somebody died in this meeting this morning. I mean spiritually. I mean it was God's last call to you. Didn't somebody say to Aaron Burr one day, you missed the presidency of the United States by one vote? There's something greater than that. Greater than being the president of the United States? What is it? Being a Christian. Yes, but I can't be a Christian. <laughs> Oh, yes, you can. Oh, no, I can't. Why not? I was in a meeting one night. So many people went forward in that meeting. 
If I remember the, 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 the argument correctly, it was this. Now the preacher had said there are, say, 30 men should be at this altar. There were 29. And he said, I should have been the 30th. And God said, come on, I want your life. And I said, no. And the spirit put pressure. He said, I said in my spirit, now you leave me alone and I'll never bother with you again if you leave me alone. He said, he's never bothered with me from that day till this. The final thing, if you were to go to France, I forget which city. Barbara in Lyon or somewhere, there's a statue and it's not very imposing. But I think it says underneath, when he was living, he hungered for bread. They gave him a statue and he was dead. It's a monument to a man called Palissy, a Palissy if you like. At that time they were trying to patent enamel, make a patent out of enamel. And he had experimented and done some very wonderful things. But one thing always got fouled up. That was when he tried to make a vessel that was purely white. And somebody brought him news one day. They said, there's a, there's a man in Italy. He has made the most gorgeous vessel and there is not one single flaw in it. it. It hasn't a thing as big as a pinhead in it. It is perfectly white. And he said, if he'll do it, I'll do it. He lived in a stately mansion. He kept buying materials, but every time he came to the final act, there was a blemish in the thing. It got so bad that he had no money. He started tearing up his Louis XIV furniture and his wonderful decorations and stuffing them into the crucible. His father-in-law came and took uh, Pilate's wife away and said, he's an idiot, he's a madman. People stood on the windows sills and looked in and said, he's crazy. All he wants to do is get a white vessel. What difference should it make? He spent all his money, he'd used all his furniture, he got his last batch of mixing and finally he made a vessel. It turned out perfect. People on the windowsill said, look at him, he's, he's dancing around and he was holding it up and saying, you're beautiful, you're pure, you're pure, you're pure. It was worth everything I had. There's no way you can cleanse your own heart. There's no religious exercise. You can shut yourself in a monastery. The devil gets in monasteries too. Many of them full of uncleanness and homosexuality. You can give your very body to be burned. You can make the most extravagant sacrifice, but it takes the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, to cleanse us from sin. To cleanse us from all sin and well pure, impure you may be if that blood covers you and you stay covered, you stay pure. You won't be faultless, you may not always be blameless, but if the Holy Spirit comes, you see, we're asking him to come into vessels that are impure. He gets the order right, cleanse me and give me thy Holy Spirit. Then will I treat transgressors thy ways. Supposing you knock on somebody's door and go to the mission field and they say, Hey, this Jesus you talk about so wonderful and he forgives sins and, and he cleanses. Let me ask you, have you got a pure heart? What would you say? Is your will pure? Is your purpose that come water, come hell or high water, come anything that God may ask? We're going into the most critical period in American history. The outlook is dark. The outlook is glorious. Jesus is coming for a church. He's coming for a bride, not for a widow. I'm going to a wedding next Saturday, a very lovely couple, down in Waco. For years they've been courting. He's gone through college. He's gone through seminary. He's one of the most praying young men in America. He seldom prays less than three to four hours a day, his uncle tells me came in the meeting when I was 14, when he, when he was 14 years of age, I was preaching and God met him. And that boy has stayed on course, he's denied himself, he's coming to that altar with purity and purpose. <coughs> with everything on the altar for God. The last thing when Bramwell Booth began to preach, he was the son of old William. They had big meetings and most of the Booth family on the platform and Grandma was going to preach. His mother, according to the officer that used to sit with William Booth, told me this. And he was an old man of 80 when I talked with him. He said Mrs. Booth would pull his sleeve and leave, lean over and say, Grandma, a pure heart, boy, a pure heart. Tell him it must be a pure heart. 
isn't it something that he can take the stony heart and make it a heart of flesh? Isn't it something he can take out all the corruption? That he can give me a heart in every thought renewed and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good, a copy, Lord, of thine. Thy nature, gracious Lord, in part, come quickly from above. Write thy new name upon my heart. Thy name on my heart, thy new best name of love. He's able to purify it. He's able to occupy it. Oh, make my heart thy dwelling place and worthy of thee. Shall we pray? Our Father, as we pause before we disperse, we want to thank you for the efficacy of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, that sinners plunged beneath that flood can lose all their guilty stains. We thank you for the heart that you cleanse are able to fill, not only fill it, but flow in it and flow out of it and overflow it, so that we go to a world which is so full of corruption, a world that has lost the power to blush. A world that has changed our language. We don't talk much about iniquity, we talk just about infirmity. A world full of idolatry. For your word says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is a sin of idolatry and they were both punishable by death, we remember. If we're to go into this dark world, we must be full of light. If we're going to this, in, this corrupt world, we must be pure in our hearts.